the impact of uh, new military capabilities in the Asia Pacific. Well, um, welcome. Uh, I'm General, and this is a joke, Lord Richards. I was until last July the Chief of Defence Staff of the United Kingdom, so I know many of the senior military people here, and they're giving me a very hard time over the fact that I'm now Lord Richards, and I, I can see why, don't worry. Um, anyway, fascinating topic uh, with some and not necessarily very obvious implications uh, to it, uh, not least defining, I'd offer, the term capability. Um, a few thoughts, therefore, to help provoke debate, but I don't think uh, that'll be particularly necessary because I know lots of you are very interested in this subject. But what capabilities are we discussing the growth of blue water capabilities uh, and their relevance, influence uh, on people who live on the land, I'd offer, not because I'm a, a general, that the connections need to be drawn a little bit more cleverly uh, than the military professional, uh, military strategist is doing. Uh, missile technology perhaps neutralizing over the next 20 years that blue water capability in which countries are pouring billions and billions of dollars at the moment. I'm not certain people have thought that through in time-honored fashion, uh, by the way, as a pendulum of military technology swings from one side to the other. Are states too interested in what some would call old technology and capability? Uh, should not militarization, cyber, the role of information operations on vulnerable uh, populations, drone developments, all these things, not be a higher or greater focus for those who want to deter or even fight future wars? Would other asymmetric thinking not be more effective than conventional capabilities, war amongst the people sort of thinking? And it was General Bradley who said at the end of the Second World War that amateurs taught tactics, professionals taught logistics. Uh, I've uh, long uh, reiterated that, and just how sustainable are some of the so-called capabilities that nations are purchasing, uh, so how sustainable are they uh, in conflict, in combat? Uh, I know, I can tell you, a lot of them couldn't do it for more than a day before they'd be exhausted. So uh, how hollow are some of these so-called capabilities that people are buying? And on the same theme, for many years I've been saying Bradley's right, but first and foremost, command and control is vital, followed by logistics, followed by tactics, which is easy enough done. Uh, if you don't get command and control right, it doesn't matter how good your weapon systems are or how good your armies, navies, and air forces are, it won't come together. And this is particularly important it, when you're talking about alliances, because alliance warfare is complex. And if you can't even talk to each other, what hope have you got to operate together under pressure? None. And of course, all this gets to the key uh, or the core of the key issue. Are countries developing capability or simply buying equipment? Now, I'm sure these and other topics will be addressed by our panel of experts to whom I now turn. And may I welcome on your behalf Air Marshal B Beerskin. Uh, Binskin, sorry, Mark, I, the one whose name I could pronounce, I got it wrong. That's all right, your uh, Lord. <laughs> thank you, Mark. Future Chief of Defence Forces, good luck. It was Admiral Mike Mullen who said uh, when he retired in uh, 2012, I went like a lot of, no, 2011, went to his uh, parade. He said, um, only my fellow Chiefs of Defence know what this job is really about. You're about to find out and you will wish to retire quite quickly. Um, Gen Major General Yao from PLA. We look forward very much to hearing uh, what you've got to say, and I don't want any quirks about Chinese lords, all right? Uh, Dr. <laughs> you should. Uh, Dr. Browse Browsekeeper, very good to see you, sir. And Lieutenant General Ng, uh, <laughs> nearly there, uh, from Singapore. And it's great to be here in Singapore, by the way. My very first posting in 1971 as Second Lieutenant Richards was to Singapore. And I, my other uh, claim to fame is I believe in uh, national strategies. If any country can demonstrate the value of a very clear national strategy that the political class was behind for 20, 30, 40 years, it's Singapore, and it explains their success. So I'm a great fan of Singapore and what you've achieved. Um, 
The, a few ground rules. You're meant to speak, please, for only five minutes. So if you do much more than that, then I'm going to start waving at you and ask you to pause, uh, because the aim is to have a debate. Uh, and I know that uh, there's lots of people here who would like to hear from you uh, beyond your prepared remarks. Uh, and after you finish that, uh, I will open it to the floor in the way you saw John Chipman do um, uh, earlier today, probably take three or four or five questions at a time and open it to the panel. So, to no, with no more ado, I'm going to start with you, Mark, if I may, on the right. Thank you. Thank you, David, and I'd look forward to your next speaking gig on motivational speeches to future CDFs. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to, to speak here today in this, uh, this forum. Now, my, the given topic that we have is the impact of new capabilities in the Asia-Pacific. But when I refer to capabilities, I'm not just going to refer to equipment. Uh, but the ability to fully employ that equipment, and I think we've just heard about that in the, uh, the introduction. Now, in line with that, and with some indulgence, I'd like to use the opportunity to reflect on a recent operation that has significant implications for our region and highlights the importance of interoperability and emerging capabilities, as well as the need to maintain strong regional multilateral relationships. And it's one of these operations that uh, is non-standard. Since 2011, Australia has broadened its strategic view of the region and begun to think more in terms of the Indo-Pacific rather than the Asia-Pacific region, and we've heard more about that today as well. This shift in strategic thinking to include the Indian Ocean reflects Australia's regional relationships and the Indian Ocean's emergence as the world's most active trade corridor. The Indo-Pacific encompasses our strategic ally, the United States, as well as our largest trading partner, China. And in fact, nine of Australia's top 10 trading partners sit in this region. In March 2014, the rest of the world also focused on the Indian Ocean, when the search for missing Malaysian Airlines flight MH370 moved, for missing, sorry, moved to the vast expanse of the southern Indian Ocean, over 2,500 kilometres off the west coast of Australia. Throughout this operation, our thoughts have always been with the families and friends of those on board, and our efforts have been driven by the desire to find out what happened. The circumstances surrounding the aircraft's disappearance and the search operation itself are unprecedented. At its peak, 23 military aircraft and 16 ships representing eight nations were actively searching more than 4.5 million square kilometres of the southern Indian Ocean. And for comparison, that's an area approximately 1.3 times the size of India. From an Australian perspective, Coordinating a multinational operations of this size and scale required a high degree of dexterity, innovation and, importantly, cooperation. Existing relationships, such as the five power defence arrangements, allowed signatory nations already familiar with each other's command and control structures and their capabilities to rapidly establish themselves as part of the joint task force. For others, like the Australian Defence Force and the People's Liberation Army engagement, this provided an opportunity to further refine cooperative practices and procedures that had been developed or started to be developed over the last couple of years. The search operation also created an unparalleled fusion of high-tech capabilities, from satellites in space to autonomous underwater vehicles searching the depths of the ocean. Existing capabilities were adapted and supplemented with emerging capabilities, specifically designed to address the unique complexities of this operation. And for example, the Royal Australian Air Force rapidly developed a specialist acoustic processor to, to assist in the subsurface search. Uh, the Australian designed and tested passive hydrophones were fitted to sonar buoys that were deployed on P3 Orion aircraft in the search area in very short time. Also significant for Australia, our E7A Wedgetail Airborne Early Warning Control aircraft, one of the highest tech aircraft that we have in our inventory, conducted its first operational sortie when it deployed as part of the search effort. This, is, this new capability for us was an invaluable asset in the context, monitoring and deconflicting the dozens of aircraft, both civilian and military, operating for extended periods in the air search zone, sometimes, as I said before, up to 2,500 kilometres from land, and it helped increase the overall safety of the search. There's no doubt that the search for MH370 in the southern Indian Ocean has tested regional capability, regional interoperability and regional relationships. The search for MH370 exemplifies a truly multinational response and demonstrates the strength of cooperation among the participating nations, 
Australia, Malaysia, China, the United States, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, Japan and the Republic of Korea. And as our Prime Minister Tony Abbott put it, to have the military forces of so many countries working together for our common humanity shows what we can do. Traditional relationships were deepened and we have established a new foundation to encourage a peripheral or to encourage peripheral relationships to strengthen and grow. Historically, humanitarian disaster relief or search and rescue operations cross territorial lines and international boundaries, and this will continue. On that basis, we should expect that cooperation will increasingly require a multilateral rather than bilateral approach in the region, and that the communities and countries we work with will vary depending on the issues and the interests involved. The search for MH370 has challenged our thinking and illustrates the need to provide insurance against unforeseen challenges that will emerge from a very unpredictable future, regardless of what that challenge may look like. It has demonstrated capability gaps and, in order to increase safety, highlighted the need for continued dialogue, continued exercises and, importantly, continued cooperation. What we choose to do with the knowledge will shape our response to the next large-scale multinational operation in our region. We have the duty to seize this as an opportunity to initiate a discussion about what we have learned from our operation in the search for MH370 in the southern Indian Ocean. And we need to do this while the momentum exists and the lessons are still fresh. Our obje objective must be to increase our capacity for interoperability, to reduce response times, as well as to clarify our expectations as a region. To that end, Australia is prepared to work with our regional partners to host a seminar with a view to establishing a regional coordination centre and regional coordination plan. In fact, we're proposing something similar in shape to NATO's disaster response coordination centre. If the experience from MH370 has taught us anything, it is that we cannot rely simply on new and emerging capabilities to respond to future challenges, i.e. not just the equipment. We need a strategy and that strategy can only be built with innovative thinking and continued program of structured, practical engagement, which includes non-traditional security cooperation. Thank you. Very good. I hope the other three follow your example, Mark. Um, General Yao, over to you, please. Thank you, my lord. Very <laughs> you see what you started? You wanted to say it. She, she wanted to say it. So she said it. <laughs> Thank you, my lord. And uh, first, I would like to uh, characterize the uh, new military capabilities in the region into four categories. The first category is uh, strategic offensive capabilities, of which the most fearsome is, of course, the nuclear weapons. In the aftermath of the nuclear weapon tests by both India and Pakistan in 1998, the, DPR, the DPRK has since 2006 had three tests of nuclear devices and is threatening to make the fourth one. The DPRK's possession of a nuclear deterrent has triggered the domestic debates uh, of uh, a nuclear uh, of a possible nuclear option in both Japan and the ROK. The Iranian nuclear issue, if not handled properly, may cause a new round of nuclear proliferation in the greater Middle East region. It has to be mentioned that all the nuclear weapon proliferation happened, occurred around China, and China has since become the country who has the most nuclear weapon states as its neighbors. Uh, and in addition to the spread of nuclear weapons, the, 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 the humanity is now faced with the most danger, with, with more danger of nuclear terrorism than ever before. Apart from nuclear offensive capabilities, strategic offense include long-range conventional means, such as the conventional prompt global strike capabilities that the United States is developing to strike any target on Earth within one hour. Such capabilities include conventionally tipped ICBMs, cruise missiles, hypersonic glides, and some space-based weapon systems which are still in conception. 
The short and the medium range ballistic missiles fielded by the Asian countries also greatly increased in both numbers and quality. The second category of new military capabilities is what we call the ballistic, ballistic missile defense, the BMD, in the Asia Pacific region. Several countries in the region have stated their interest in such a BMD system. However, it was the United States who developed and fielded the most robust BMD systems with these alliances in the region, such as with Japan and with, the, with Australia, and also to a lesser extent, maybe in the future, with ROK. Um, the third category includes what we call the emerging military capabilities in global commons, such as outer space and cyberspace. The exploration of emerging global commons has greatly contributed to the economic growth and the social progress in, in, in Asia Pacific states. However, with the in increased dependence on cyber and outer space, modern societies are more vulnerable to military capabilities, to military operations in space, in outer space and cyberspace. Tradi traditional military concepts su such as freedom of action and uh, ac access denial have already found their ways into the operational doctrines of some more advanced militaries. <laughs> Countries who have already established the military commands to conducting space warfare are also have, have also set up military commands for cyber warfare and operational teams for both offensive and defensive cyber operations. Although up to now we cannot evaluate the effectiveness of cyber warfare capabilities, we can have a sense of how it will work from the alleged attacks against Iranian nuclear infrastructure by Stuxnet virus. The last category is most obvious, that is the fast military modernizations, fast-paced military modernization of the regional armed forces. The United States military, by far the most powerful and advanced in the region, is upgrading its operational platforms with new and more capable systems. And most of the new weapon systems will be first deployed in the Asia-Pacific region, and a greater portion of them will be deployed in the Asia-Pacific region, as what we have learned from this morning's speech by Secretary Hegel. For example, the fourth class aircraft carrier, the F-22 fighters, the MV-22 Osprey, Ospreys, and so on and so forth. At the same time, the U.S. military has drawn lessons from the two decade-long wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and invested, more in, and invested heavily in new technologies which will possibly define the future shape of war uh, and the future warfare. We can see the numerous types of unmanned aerial vehicles, the uh, UAVs and what we call the drones, which have played such an important role in the, recent, in the recent military operations. Asian countries are purchasing and developing major combat system themselves. For instance, Japan will have three global hawks. So far they have two. Uh, it, it has two to boost its surveillance capability in East China Sea and purchase uh, the other advanced fighters from the United States. Other Asian states are boosting their modernization efforts as well and fo focus on the upgrade. I, I, I think the investment is focused on uh, naval and uh, air force equipment. Both India and China have fielded aircraft carriers, 
Vietnam and ROK have increased underwater capabilities by purchasing kilo-class submarines and introducing German submarine technology. India, Vietnam, and several ASEAN states acquired whether Su, uh, Su-27 or Su-30 from, from, from Russia or F-16 from the United States. It seems that Asian's military modernization is gaining momentum and getting into the fast track. One more point I have to make is about the transformation of operational doctrine in accordance with the modernization of military capabilities and the redeployment of forces. One example is the joint operational concept of LC battle, which emphasizes the integrated and the timely use of joint forces, the networked for uh, CISR systems, and the emerging space and cyber capabilities to counter the so-called area denial and anti-access AD slash A2 threats. So I, how many time do I have? Doing pretty well, um, about Can half a I, minute. Half a minute, okay. It's a special favor, because you called me Lord. <laughs> so I will call you Lord <coughs> twice, and then give me one minute. It's a private <laughs> joke, you know. yeah. So I just want to mention that maybe the, the driving forces for the, uh, uh, the new development of military capability, one is, of course, the development of economy. In China, we have the, the thing that Fu uh, 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 a rich country with a strong military, and uh, with the development, and the government can spend more on defense. And also, a second reason is the, the, the re-evaluation of security threats and uh, security environment, uh, which has changed quite uh, drastically and uh, is also one of the driving forces behind uh, military modernization. And also the, 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 the development of uh, military technology and the, uh, the coming of the information era, uh, which provide the technical uh, driving force for uh, new military capabilities. I will stop here. No, uh <laughs> Well, no, it was really fascinating and, and fantastic stuff. I mean, one of the sub-themes you might like to think about is, is there a new arms race? Uh, I know one or two of you are interested in that, um, being sort of developing of its own accord in the new military-industrial complexes that are exploiting differences between nations without us really being aware of it. And I think that's an interesting uh, thing to pose in its own right. Um, Dr. Brauchsieper, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First of all, let me thank you for the chance to take part in this uh, very important dialogue and to contribute some observations and some experiences from, from outside the Asia-Pacific region, namely from Europe and from Germany. First of all, I think the increase in defense spending in the Asia-Pacific region is an established fact, according at least to some statistics in 2012, for the first year in modern times, Asian states spent more on defense than Europeans did. As such, we've all been invited here to consider the impact of new military capabilities in the region and beyond. Please allow me to launch our conversation by making three observations and then offer some conclusions with regard to that. First, the Asia-Pacific region, as we all know, has experienced a period of extended economic growth in general. And historically, periods of increased economic well-being have often translated into an increase in government spending in general, and also in governing spend, government spending on modernization of defense capabilities. And so historians would probably agree that such a period of economic development has often been accompanied by increased defense spending. My second observation is about what is 
driving increased defense spending. For some countries, it might be the perceived need to catch up the military to their level of their political ambitions. Others might be driven by a feeling of insecurity, be it real or only perceived. Given the number of current territorial disputes in the Asia-Pacific region, such motivations seem to be logical to some extent. Talking about these motivations, we all know that an increase in defense spending alone does not buy security. It can even have the opposite effect of further increasing insecurity, a process that is also known as the security dilemma. And this leads me to my third observation. Arms races can lead to the risk of misperception and miscalculation with terrible results. All these observations are based on what we see here in Asia and on our experience also in Europe. And this leads me to my conclusion, which is, again, a very European one. I have not come here to tell you that after many decades of high defense expenditures in Europe, other regions uh, have no right to invest more in defense spending. That would not be very credible. But uh, the European experience, I, th I think, is as such. The arms race during the Cold War times in Europe could also have ended up in a disaster if we hadn't been able to establish a system of transparency, confidence building, and constant dialogue on exactly these core questions of security and armament. This was our reassurance against mistrust, miscalculation, misinterpretation, and potentially false reactions. It is also true to say that it took a long time until all countries in the wider Europe agreed to the principles and rules of confidence building, but it works, and in the end, it was more than a win-win situation. We overcame mistrust and lowered step by step the potential of escalation of conflicts. And by the way, even in these times of the Ukraine crisis, these methods of uh, confidence building and dialogue still work, at least to some extent, even during this crisis. And I say all this not to promote our European example. I'm aware that any build-up of a system of confidence, building, and transparency in Asia and its sub-regions has to be fully based on the very specific historical traditions of this region. But I say this to offer our experiences and to make the point that the sooner consensus can be found on the need for such a system, the better for the prosperity of all countries concerned and the better for the well-being of the people living in this region. So, a system of confidence building and transparency will certainly not solve all the problems related to increased deficit spending, but it does, however, help to deal with unintended consequences of increased deficit spending. And it gives also a solid basis for building up a strong security architecture for the region. Thank you very much. Excellent. Again, okay. thank you very much. Um, I think that latter point is extremely important, and some of you might like to ponder that. Um, the, the law of unintended consequences is out there, um, and only through the protocols and processes we developed in the Cold War uh, can you mitigate that risk sensibly. Um, thank you. And um, last but not least, the General Ng. Thank you, Sir General Richards. Uh, Air Marshal Mark Binskin. CDF designate, ADF, the, or Major General uh, Yao Yunzhu, Director Center of American China American Defense Relations and Research Fellow of the PLA, Dr. Ralph Braxepi, Parliamentary State Secretary of Defense, my fellow colleagues and distinguished delegates. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak this afternoon about the impact of new military capabilities in the Asia-Pacific region. It is a very interesting topic and a very wide-ranging title where one could 
touch literally on vast arrays of capabilities from network-centric warfare to unmanned systems and to even nuclear technology, as Mr. General Yao has alluded to. Uh, however, for the five minutes that Sir Lord Richards have afforded me, I would like to just focus my presentation on the application of military capability in the domain of new, non-traditional security issues, especially in the HADR in our region. Uh, first of all, I would like to state clearly that the role of militaries would still be centred on safeguarding our country's sovereignty and territorial integrity. However, it is increasingly common for militaries to be called upon to deal with non-traditional security challenges that are transnational in nature. This is especially so given the increasingly complex and globalised nature of our regional security landscape. These new non-traditional security threats have given rise to new military capabilities such as cyber defence, as well as the application of conventional military platforms in new areas. For example, the deployment of maritime and helicopter assets to combat piracy or to assist in the disaster relief and provide humanitarian aid. In addition, the operating environment in which we deal with this issue has expanded tremendously in the civil-military dimension, where stakeholders have now included multiple militaries, government and non-governmental agencies and organisations. It is within this context that I would like to share some of my perspective of how these new military capabilities have impacted our region. In particular, as I said, I would like to zoom in on how HDR operations in our region have influenced the way we organise and operate our militaries in our regional security landscape. I've chosen HDR as the main example to illustrate my view because it has become increasingly clear that natural disasters have disproportionately devastating effects in the Asia-Pacific region. According to APEC, although the Asia-Pacific region comprises approximately half of our Earth's surface area and 40% of the world's population, it has experienced over 70% of the world's natural disasters. In the past decade, the Singapore Armed Forces have mounted over 20 HADR operations from the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami to last year's Typhoon Haiyan. And I'm certain that these numbers would only increase given the rapid population growth in Asia, urbanisation and climate changes in our region. Hence, it has become increasingly important for regional militaries to develop certain frameworks and mechanisms to respond to natural disasters in a coordinated, effective and sustainable manner. And I must say there has been much progress made in this area of HDR in our region. Within the ASEAN framework, there are already numerous notable developments. Some examples I'll just quote include the ASEAN Agreement on Disaster Management and Emergency Response, the ASEAN Emergency Rapid Assessment Team, and the Disaster Emergency Logistics System for ASEAN, just to name a few. In addition, just barely a year ago, the ASEAN Defence Ministers Meeting Plus conducted its first joint exercise centred on HADR and military medicine in Brunei. This first ever large-scale exercise involved 18 countries, more than 3,000 personnel, six ships and more than 15 helicopters. These mechanisms and exercises are important in strengthening and promulgating linkages and interoperability between militaries. They have also helped to enhance the confidence and mutual trust across the region when dealing with non-traditional security threats. Maybe it's something that Ralph has alluded to. Even in HADR operations, there are secondary effects of confidence building and trust building. However, I would say that these mechanisms and multilateral exercises still would not adequately address our HADR challenges, especially in the immediate aftermath of natural disasters, where coordination of efforts is paramount. I am broadly referring to the first 24 
to 48 hours after an initial disaster has, has hit a, dis, uh, a certain area. And especially when the affected state is completely overwhelmed by the scale of the disaster and lacks the necessary bandwidth to mount a coordinated response, much like Philippines last year. And like what Sir Lord Richards, General Lord Richards and all his citers have said, what key role can the military play? I think the element of capability that the militaries are strong in is command control. And given this unique capability within the military, we have uh, certainly a role to enhance security through HDR. As such, our Defence Minister, Dr Nguyen Han, recently proposed to host a regional HADR coordination centre, RHCC in short, within the Chang'e Command and Control Centre in the Chang'e Naval Base. The aim of the RHCC is to enable militaries to work together and respond quickly in a coordinated disaster relief effort. It will be expected to pre-plan and surmise the pledged assets from various militaries that are able to respond rapidly to a natural disaster. The RHCC will also be expected to assist in assessing the, cris the crisis situation and help the affected state to coordinate military efforts. I'm happy to announce that the SAF has already taken some steps to conceptualize and implement the RHCC. But surely this cannot be done by one country alone. We will need the support of our regional partners to make this work. And on that note, I'm heartened to register the keen interest and support of many of my counterparts for the RHCC during these few days of interactions. Air Marshal Binskin is one of those, and I appreciate his remarks that the militaries can work together, the ADF and the SAF can work together to help realise this capability. As you can see, HADR is just one of the many new military capabilities that we will need to develop in order to address the wide spectrum of non-traditional security challenges. It is also clear that these new capabilities would require militaries to work together under the existing security frameworks to provide a coordinated, effective and sustainable effort. Indeed, these new non-traditional security challenges imposed upon us imposed upon us has presented an opportunity to strengthen cooperation and interoperability between militaries, thereby enhancing our overall security architecture and contributing to the stability and security to the Asia-Pacific region. During last week's Nikkei's conference, our Prime Minister, Mr. Li Xianlong, described the key trends and uncertainty shaping the Asia-Pacific region in the next 20 years. He said, and I quote, whatever the forces driving the politics and policies of each country, ultimately we share a common interest in peace and, secure, and, in peace and prosperity in Asia. All stakeholders, big and small, have a responsibility to make this vision come true, unquote. It is this desire to promote mutual understanding and trust that guides Singapore and the Singapore Armed Forces to continue to provide strong support to important platforms such as the ADMM Plus and the Shangri-La Dialogue. Likewise, non-traditional security challenges have definitely provided an avenue for regional militaries to strengthen cooperation and coordination while enhancing mutual trust and confidence. Then, therefore, let us continue to work together to tackle these challenges and build a better future for our region and the wider world. Thank you for your kind attention. I look forward to hearing your views. Well, thank you very much, and I think uh, you, um, you have very um, cleverly and, and well brought out the point I was making about command and control and its critical importance to a proper military capability, an area that is uh, often uh, omitted and uh, not really understood by many of our political leaders who view it almost as unnecessary. But if you can't respond efficiently to a disaster, however tough that might be, what price those same countries responding uh, effectively to a joined-up military threat 
uh, let alone a military attack of some kind. It, they won't get off the ground. So I think it is a very useful way of bringing that home to people. Um, right. Um, what we'll do now is uh, take about three or four or five questions at a time. Um, it's quite difficult for us to see um, names, certainly with my eyesight. Uh, if, if you could put your uh, names up like this, then I will, um, ideally, with your name pointing at me. But uh, when you ask a question, um, just say who you are, and we'll keep a log. And uh, at some point, I'll say, OK, we'll take the questions, and then we'll go on to the next group. So I'm going to do it easy. I'll start with you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I'm Gary Seymour from the Belfer Center at uh, Harvard University. I want to ask each of the panelists to, in their professional judgment, tell us how they think the military balance of power will look in the next decade or so. All the countries in the region are engaging in build-up and modernization, and you know clearly they're uh, uh, at different rates. Uh, they will bring into service different capabilities and in particular I'd like to focus on naval and air capacity in the region and I'd be interested in their judgment about whether they expect over the next decade or so any fundamental shift or will the current balance continue to be in place. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to pick up on one of the topics. You didn't say who you were. I'm sorry. Um, Nigel Linkster, Director of Transnational Threats and Political Risk uh, here at IISS. Um, I'd like to pick up on uh, one of the uh, points listed by Major General Yao in her presentation, which was the issue of uh, cyber capabilities. Um, because perhaps the most interesting thing about cyber capabilities is that these are not capabilities that are solely deployed in times of conflict. Indeed, the whole point about cyber capability is that these are capabilities being deployed by states and non-state actors alike all the time. And we have this kind of constant um, hum of cyber activity operating below a threshold that might, um, at which the laws of armed conflict might apply, um, which seems to me to create potentially very new um, situation, and particularly in a, a region where there is already quite a lot of tension um, and competition, um, as we've seen. Um, I'd like to ask Major General Yao and actually any of, of the other panelists whether you know, she feels that uh, um, we are anywhere close to having any kind of doctrines or uh, agreed norms as to how um, activities within the cyber domain should be conducted within the military dimension? H hugely important question. I used to say to my people, you've got to be as comfortable maneuvering in cyberspace as you are on the land, sea, and the air. And I can tell you none of us are anywhere near achieving that, partly because we haven't got a doctrine or any processes to govern it. Um, so at the end, I can't see your name, but... Thank you very much, uh, General Richards. Uh, my name is Nobori Amaguchi from Japan. Um, I'm a um, retired army aviator who remember the old days uh, of Cold War. And I, I, I was glad to, uh, to listen to all the uh, presentations. Uh, but the particularly, I was interested in what uh, Dr. Rauk Sieb uh, has said uh, about the, um, the build up, military build up in this region. And sounding like uh, uh, we need we need to have uh, a kind of uh, arms arms control uh, in this region. I, this is actually exactly what I have kept telling other people uh, in this uh, dialogue for the last three years. Um, in short, um, the arms control here in Asia Pacific, or the particularly in Southeast Asia, is not like uh, one in Europe. Uh, where the excessive uh, uh, the amount of forces should be cut down. But rather, uh, if you look at the capabilities of regional countries, particularly navies and air forces, uh, they are um, about, to, about to build up um, enough capability, or um, just short of enough capabilities. Uh, but uh, unlike the Europe, um, this, uh, this area uh, has a kind of uh, more uh, cooperative uh, nature, uh, particularly uh, within ASEAN countries. In that sense, uh, my argument is that 
the arms control in the, in the Southeast Asia uh, should be um, in 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 a form uh, that everybody seeks to harmonize build up rather than balanced uh, balanced uh, cut back. So uh, that is really important and. Um, it, those countries, including China, Japan, U uh, Korea, uh, U.S., uh, is the safety of navigation in this area, and uh, for which uh, we have to share the burdens and responsibilities. Uh, to do so, uh, we have to have uh, capabilities. Uh, in, that, in, in that sense, we can share the responsibilities, uh, and that should be reflected in a kind of uh, arms control in this region. Thank you. Um, a point that you provoked, and I think it's a very important one. I'm just going to go simply round the room, and I know one or two people at the back as well. I spotted them. Don't, don't worry. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lars Olof Lindgren. I come from a Swedish defence company called Saab. Um, uh, the, the question of the reasons behind or rationale for the modernisation or uh, increase in military capabilities or even arms race, it depends what you want to call it, has been mentioned, especially by uh, General Yao and uh, Dr. Um, Brauchsipe. Uh, one reason was that the countries here have more income to spend more budgetary means. Another has been mentioned by Dr. Brauchsipe speaker uh, that um, uh, to uh, to support uh, ambitions to become a more political power that uh, arms would uh, support this and it could be in general sense it could also be more specific to project power in the region and so forth uh, and a third which General Yao mentioned was the change in security environment and, and actually I would be very interested to her, hear her uh, elaborate a bit more on what she means by the, what is perceived by this change in security environment. Thank you. Well, I'm going to uh, stop there because there's some very chunky questions there and we'll all forget what we've been asked. So um, the first one was from Gary was addressed to all of you. So if I do the easy thing, Mark, start with you. And then uh, if you would pick up the ones that have been addressed to you individually, I think that would be helpful too, but thanks. No, no problems. I think I've only got the, the one to start off with there. Uh, I think if I look at it in generic terms, it will the balance, how will the balance of power look in the next decade or so? If you, if you look at the way things are going at the moment with the growth in the, the region, that the, the grows of prosperity, uh, the various nations with that, increases the ability to invest across the board. Uh, and because a strong security leads to strong prosperity, you get into this, this, this loop a bit there. Um, with that investment in those capabilities, then you have the ability to, to better protect your national interests. Uh, and in fact, you'll see more investment by some nations if they feel that those national interests are going to be contested uh, in the, the future. So I think if, if, you, if you look at it with all that in play, the fact is those with greater growth are going to have the greater potential to grow in relativity. And I think everyone's going to grow, it's just you're going to see a skew slightly in those, with those nations that have an increased relative growth, I think, over the, the, the time. So will there be a shift? Yeah, you, there will be a, a shift over that, that time as the various nations grow in their, uh, in their prosperity. Uh, to the uh, question of what would be the military balance in uh, one decade time, I think it, it will look pretty much the same as the uh, current situation. The uh, sole military superpower is still the United States in the Asia Pacific. And China's military capability will be uh, growing uh, but the gap between China and the United States will remain almost the same. But China's military capabilities will be improved comparative to 
uh, other uh, medium-sized and the smaller-sized states in the region. That's my personal. But uh, the balance of power is uh, pretty much the same, not very drastic change. About the uh, cyber capabilities and is there cyber operational doctrine, uh, personally, I think that uh, uh, the cyberspace should be, so far there has not been very much, uh, uh, not many establishment, established uh, rules and the norms in, on, on behavior in cyberspace. The best future, the best option is to exclude military options altogether from the cyberspace. And uh, so far we still have the chance and the time to do it. But uh, I personally doubt that uh, it can be accomplished. Uh, taking from the historical lessons that, that once your human beings by nature would like to use any space, would, would like to apply military capabilities and military operations in any newly found space where human activities become uh, important. Uh, but personally, I think if we have, we can have uh, the consensus, we can have the uh, urgent, the, the, the feeling of urgency that uh, military operations in cyberspace, the, the, the damage caused by a uh, cyber war might e exceed the imagination of us, might be very enormous. And maybe such urgency can help us to uh, build a consensus on banning of military on, on, on banning of war in cyberspace altogether, but I'm not uh, personally not optimistic about it. Last question is about uh, the uh, changing security environment. From China's perspective, I think for a very long time, starting from late 1970s, the uh, perception of security uh, environment of China has been one that peace and development is the same of our times. So we should spend most of our energy and the resources on the development of economy, on improving uh, people's uh, living standard. And, uh, but recently I think the, the, the assessment of the uh, situation has changed a little bit. Although we still think that peace and, and development is, is the main trend, uh, but uh, we, we, we do think, the chi China does think chi or, uh, the academic circles in China or some in the policy circles do think that uh, uh, China during its course of peaceful rise has been has been meeting, has been contained, or has been, there has, there have been efforts to contain or to offset or to hedge against uh, China's rise uh, in security issues, uh, in security, so far as security environment is concerned. And also I have just mentioned that uh, the proliferation of nuclear weapons, they are, uh, uh, the forward deployment of military uh, forces and major weapon platforms near and around uh, China and which cannot be perceived positively in China. Okay. Very much indeed. I mean, the cyber point, I, I, I'm now going to become an advocate for uh, women in the military being heard, uh, because uh, I think that we, none of us have an idea how devastating the use of cyber will be in a general war. Uh, you've seen nothing yet, uh, and I think it's really a very urgent issue. So thank you for bringing that out. Um, 
Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Samu mentioned uh, the military balance of power, and I think this is an important issue. Um, in Cold War times in Europe, this confrontation of East and West it was certainly a threat for the whole world, and there is no reason to hope that it comes back. So it's good that we have overcome it, but there was something special in that time, namely there were two blocks that had to uh, that had to negotiate with one another, and when they came to terms, there was progress. And it, it seems to me there is no uh, comparable situation here. You d you don't just have two counterparts who have to come to terms with each other. So the situation here seems to be, to some extent, more complicated with regard to that, and to come to coming to terms. Um, as I said. Uh, we clearly see in Europe that this is an economically very dynamic region, which is to the benefit of the whole world, also for our industry, no doubt about it. So this is a very dynamic region. Anyway, in NATO, for example, we have a discussion about the spending of 2% of GDP for defense. Germany does not spend 2% of GDP. We spend less. As far as I am informed, some countries here in the region spend more than 2% of their vastly growing GDP. So I don't have to criticize that. I don't want to criticize it. I, I, just, have, I just observe it. And it is my strong conviction that I just want to repeat also with regard to what our friend from Japan, for example, said, the necessity for arms control still there, so the necessity of building a system of mutual confidence and of transparency is uh, certainly of utmost importance if you want to direct these developments into a constructive in, in, in a constructive way. I think uh, my understanding, and many more expert here, that uh, the political leaders in the region do understand that point, but they have yet to deliver on uh, the architecture that you're talking about. Um, General Ng. Well, uh, Gary, thank you for the question. Um, ten years is really too short to have any noticeable shifts in the balance of power of the magnitude that you're talking about. So I largely agree with what uh, M. Marshall Binskin and what Major General Yao has said. But the bigger point is really whether military, the balance of military power is the only issue at play. If you look at the next 20 to 30 years, the shifting of overall power may not just be in the military realm. It will be the usage of soft power, including economic leverages in the exercise of national sovereign will. I think if we put the whole equation together, then you will probably see uh, new equilibrium in the Asia-Pacific region. Um, for a small country like Singapore, therefore, when we look at the Asia-Pacific security, we do look at it in a collective manner. So in partial answer to my Japanese colleague from uh, Asashi Simbun, is it? My aviation friend. Is that I don't look at it so much as arms control or arms race, but the collective security of small countries in ASEAN uh, through mechanisms like ADMM Plus are uh, useful architecture for us to promote our own security in these vast regions where there are medium powers and the play of superpowers. It is not an unknown thing that we welcome uh, benign powers into our region so long as they have a stabilizing role. So whatever the balance of power may be, so long as they are benign and they add to the general stability of this region, I think uh, we welcome it. And part of, in my personal opinion, part of what our collective arms expenditure is to make sure that small countries in the collective framework uh, might have a say. Thanks. 
uh, one of the issues for you will do you turn that into some sort of militarily usable or military utility um, you're not necessarily want to do that at the moment but that's, that'll be one of the big challenges I think you face. Now, because uh, I've been asked for a quick right of reply, and she's been so candid, I've given her, I'm giving you 30 seconds. Yeah, I, ju I, I just want to say that, uh, uh, I just want to ask how many of you know how, what is the percentage of chi Chinese military spending in its GDP? Do you think it's more than 2%? How many do you think is more than 2%? Please raise hands your up. hands. Yeah, more than 2. More than 2%. How many think is more than 3%? I will tell you, for many, many years, the percentage of defense spending in Chinese GDP is 1.3. No, well, take her to word. I'm not, I'm not arguing. No, 30 minutes. <laughs> exactly the good. same percentage as Germany. Exactly the same percentage. I think we won't trade this one too far, but anyway, very interesting point. Um, uh, we're just over 2% in Britain, I wish you to know, and we don't get much for it, I can tell you. Um, <laughs> now, I know there's, there's one chap at the back. I just want to pick up um, the gentleman there just to prove that I am keeping an eye on the, on the rear seats, but uh, could you ask your question, please? Uh, I'm Trevor Jashankar. I'm a fellow with the German Marshall Fund. Um, I have a question for uh, General Yao. Um, you correctly highlighted at the beginning of your presentation uh, concerns about uh, nucle nuclear and missile technology proliferation in Asia. Um, however, critics argue that China has not played a particularly helpful role in addressing the issue, uh, particularly with respect to Pakistan, uh, a country which now, uh, by some estimates, has the fifth largest nuclear arsenal, uh, or Iran. Uh, or for that matter, DPRK. Uh, what in, uh, I, I'd like to, um, my question to you is actually, what is China doing to play um, a more constructive role in addressing the challenge uh, with, with respect particularly to those three countries, Pakistan, Iran, and DPRK? Thank you. So um, I'm, I'm not quite on the, um and I, I, I didn't quite understand your question. You see China has not helped, or China helped the proliferation or China helped the non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. What is China doing to actually address the issue? Uh, you, you, men you mentioned this is a cause of concern, yes. um, and that is the vertical yes. proliferation. Um, so you, you, you are saying what, what that China is helping the uh, spreading of nuclear weapons? No, 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 I'm, 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 no, 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 I'm asking you, what, 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 what do you think, you, you highlighted that this is a cause of concern, and given China's relations with those countries, what is China doing to play a helpful and constructive role in addressing it? Yeah, I'm Suri Narayan from the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore. This is a question addressed to Major General Yao. Uh, you have said that outer space is also a new frontier area for military capabilities. And there was this anti-satellite weapon test by the Chinese a few years ago, which the U.S. described as a new Sputnik moment for the U.S. to catch up with and to probably overtake China. What is the state of play in regard to outer space weaponization between China and the US? And secondly, you know that India and China also have military to military relationship of some kind or the other. Given the unresolved border dispute between the two countries, what do you think is the way forward for military to military relations between the two countries, China and India? And if I can have one more question, it is to Air Marshal. Uh, given your experience of uh, attending the ADMM Plus meetings, do you think it has served its purpose at all? And what was its purpose in the first place? Because many of us really don't understand that. And uh, probably I will leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. I'll just answer. I've never attended an ADMM Plus meeting, so I can't answer that one for you. Sorry. You can use his imagination in a minute. Uh, um, I have a comment, and I would like to, not a comment, really a question. You know, we talk about arms control. 
and we seem to only look at a particular type of arms. We talk of nuclear arms, then you start with nuclear weapons only. You talk of space, you talk of space. I think it's about time when we talk of arms control, we should look at the comprehensive national power of a country. Without that, we will never get uh, to an arms control, looking at only one specific part of an arms control. I would like to have your views on that. That should we not look beyond, the arms control should fit into the overall uh, national power. The second issue uh, stems from what um, and the Chair General Richard said about logistics, operational logistics, after having looked at operational logistics of the Indian Army some many years ago. I think we're not looking at uh, the development of ports being undertaken by China in South Asia. For example, in Myanmar, in uh, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, uh, while right now it may look like it's only a development of a port, but all these ports also, since we are not clear if there's any connotation of its military use later on, we need to be clear, is there a connotation of military use? And why I ask this, doing my research recently, I'm looking at these developments and I try to find out as to how much amount of money has gone into developing these ports and are they given as totally as grants or are they loans? And if they are loans, what is the repaying capacity of those countries? And if they can't repay, how will it play out? So looking five years down the line, yes, there's a question, I'll ask, that's, yes, it's looking at, if you're playing, if you're looking at the, uh, these ports coming in later on, will there be a military connotation to it? And this uh, question is to Jen Liao. You want me to repeat it? <laughs> Well, no, I think we've got it. I mean, yeah, it's a sort of a modern-day version of German railway development. Uh, was there a wartime purpose in the, don't worry, um, <laughs> in the 1870s, 1880s? Yes, there was. Um, but no one saw it at the time. Uh, ports, uh, is there a hidden purpose uh, in the development of the ports? Is, and your help in developing the ports in, for example, Myanmar is the question. You, you ponder it while we go on to the next one. Um, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Patrick Keller. I'm the coordinator for foreign and security policy at the Konrad Adenauer Foundation in Berlin, Germany. And my question goes to General Yao as well. Um, General, you talked about the strategy of anti-access and area denial. Uh, you even called it a doctrine uh, of AAAD. Um, and I think I can understand the purpose of this doctrine because it allows for practical parity without full spectrum investments uh, uh, in the force. Uh, it might be sufficient to invest just in certain missiles or submarines to achieve maybe something that amounts to parity, say with the US, within 10 years, uh, at least for all practical purposes. So what I, my question is, uh, could you maybe tell us a bit more about what exactly your country is investing in when it comes to uh, pursuing this doctrine and this strategy? And what do you think might be the reactions or what can you already observe as reactions by the US and its partners in the region? Thank you. Right. Things like anti, long-range anti-ship missile technology, those sort of things. Okay, well, I think we'll pause there. Again, lots of uh, sort of inferences and implications and some quite complex questions. Um, I'll just start from the right again, if I may, Mark, easy solution there, and then we'll work down mainly, I'm afraid, General Yao, predictably, uh, most of them are your way. So I'll start with the, uh, and really it's the ADMM plus meetings. I'm not that old, I haven't been to that many, in fact. Um, but I can tell you what the, the ADMM Plus, what I see it gives for us and gives to the region. And, and it gives us a, uh, I guess, establish a framework for, for discussion and get nations together. And not just just general discussion, but to, to work together in, uh, in areas of common concern. And uh, so you've got the expert working groups there that develop a level of cooperation in various areas, co-chairs, uh, that lead to, whether it be desktop top exercises, further discussion, field exercises. For example, we had the maritime security exercise last year. Um, and then it sort of develops through. So I think it, it, it forms a very important framework for the region. Um, and I see a lot, of, lot for it into the, the future. Yeah. So what can China do to, to do the non-proliferation, not the proliferation of nuclear weapons? That's the question. Uh, I think China has done a lot. China has contributed to the 
attempt, the effort of uh, denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula by first setting a three-party talks and then uh, a six-party talks. And that six-party talks framework has uh, continued for several years. And, and, and that framework did achieved some, some agreement which has not been carried out. And currently, the six-party talks is at a deadlock. But still, most people, most of the parties in the framework think that if we want to have a nuclear-free Korean Peninsula, we have to come back to the six-party to the six-party talks. And uh, on the Iranian nuclear issue, uh, China is one of the five uh, permanent members of Security Council. And the five plus one, the plus one is Germany, has recently made some breakthroughs or progress on how to solve the uh, enrichment issue in uh, Iran. And I have to say that uh, China, of all the Security Council, China has supported all the Security Council resolutions concerning the Iranian nuclear issue. And on uh, India and uh, Pakistan, China has supported the uh, uh, UN Security Council resolution and uh, exercised sanctions of, on the, these two countries who have tested nuclear weapons in 1996 and uh, 1998. And it was some other countries who have break away from the sanctions. It, it, it was not China. So my, the question on outer space, um, how many anti satellite test have the United States conducted and have the former Soviet Union conducted? I don't know how many people know in this room. And uh, is there any, China has most recently always been labeled as a violator of international law as a country who tries to get away from international norms. But what is the international norms concerning, concerning such test? So I don't know how to answer it. So when China did it, it is against international norms. When some other country did it, did it, it's okay. And on the uh, and and also, I think China has has together with Russia um, came up with one or two suggestions or draft treaty draft on banning the placement of weapons in outer space, and that draft treaty has not been positively responded by, by some other countries in the Convention of Disarmament at Geneva. And the Indian-China military relations, I'm not, I'm not quite an, I'm not an expert on that, but I think the military-to-military -military relationship between India and China is, is robust and especially recently. And uh, uh, I think it, it, it will improve uh, in the future. Mm, but I'm not quite in the uh, business, because I, so I cannot give you very concrete uh, examples. But uh, to my knowledge, we have joint exercise, joint training programs, exchange of military students and also uh, regular defense consultation talks. So it's a very healthy and robust meal uh, meal relationship. We also have, along the borders, the disputed land borders, we have 
arrangements to talk with each other regularly and in time of crisis. The last question is about China's ADA2 strategy. I don't think China has such a strategy. When I made the ADA2, when I mentioned ADA2 in my presi presentation, I didn't mention China. I think I, I, I said that the United States has developed an operational concept called LC battle, which is supposed to counter, to, to, to offset the, the so-called ADA2 capabilities. This is not a Chinese concept. We don't use this concept. We don't use, even use this term in our military jargon. So I, I really don't know what ADA2 is exactly or accurately referred to in American military doctrines or terminology. So I think it's better if you can ask American <laughs> colleagues here to answer your question. Thank you. You don't want to have a go on ports? No, okay, sorry. Do you want to add anything? <laughs> First of all, you should not be you should not be afraid of the German railway. This is what I can <laughs> assure you. There is no very efficient. <coughs> I don't want to comment on that. Okay. <laughs> um, well, the question that you raised, Mr. Singh, was concerning overall national power. I don't know whether I understood that correctly. I, I don't know whether you think of the nuclear issue. I mean, generally, uh, I tend to say yes w with regard to arms control. All the arms that the country disposes of should be taken into account. That's what, uh, what I should like to add with regard to that. And let me say I share the appreciation of General Yao of the progress in the negotiations with Iran of the 5 plus 1, but I should also uh, like to stress that we are still concerned about this issue. We're still strongly concerned about it. Um, General, anything? Okay. Um, we, we will drop the issue of ports until afterwards um, by mutual agreement. Um, right. We've got time for one more round of questions. I've got two uh, the, there. If I could start with you, sir. Uh, Nils built CTSS Japan. Um, General Yao, um, if at the risk of beating a dead horse, as they would say, if we could address the uh, real size of the uh, Chinese defense budget and um, for confidence building measure, would it not be uh, wise to really have transparency in the uh, defense budgets across the Asian region? And um, likewise with technology and technological upgrades. Uh, would it not be wise to have full transparency between nations in that regard as well? Thank you. Okay, we'll come back to that. Um, you don't want one now, no? You're busy writing, I think. Uh, yes, sir, please. <laughs> please. Thank you. Um, my name is uh, Khalid Banuri, um, Mr. Chairman. I'm a retired air commodore from Pakistan Air Force, currently Director General of Arms Control and Disarmament Affairs. Um, my question is, straightforward and basic. Uh, and the view of the panel is um, these um, emerging new capabilities, equipments, and technologies, are these technologies driving the respective security doctrines, or is there another explanation? And while you're at it, um, would you also um, reflect on your respective views of whether there is a conscious consideration of uh, the notion of the security dilemma to those potential adversaries that are in, in your region. Thank you. For everybody, and uh, yes, please, our Japanese aviator. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, General Richards, again. Uh, just I want to, to make a footnote for uh, General Yao's comment um, uh, to support uh, General Yao. <laughs> Actually, anti-satellite, uh, Chinese anti-satellite te test was uh, uh, done in January 2007 um, at the altitude of uh, 8 to 8, 8 to 8, 8, uh, 800 to 8, 850 kilometer. That caused uh, uh, thousands of debris. 
um, right just uh, one year later, the uh, U.S. Uh, shut down one satellite, uh, which was almost uh, fo uh, all fall falling down uh, to the earth. Uh, so U.S. Uh, um, saw that it was dangerous, so it, it shut down. It was uh, it was at the altitude of 200 to 250. That means all the debris are going uh, going back into the atmosphere uh, within a couple of days. Uh, no fear about the collision of uh, uh, debris, but. Unfortunately, Chinese case uh, still there are a number of the debris uh, um, uh, remaining, and the U.S. Uh, I, I was once informed uh, uh, by the U.S. Uh, U.S. official that uh, once a Chinese satellite was in danger uh, with uh, the debris, uh, which actually uh, China created, and the U.S. Uh, kindly informed the Chinese government of the fact, and uh, China's uh, satellite was safe. So I, I think. Uh, even though it was uh, uh, kind of uh, the fact, uh, you know, um, uh, now we know um, we know it is really dangerous uh, to make uh, debris at the altitude of eight eight hundred kilometer. Thank you very much. Frightening. Uh, yes. Good. Last one, I think. Unless um, anyone hand else, hand just raise your hand. Okay. Last one. The hand uh, James Defence Weekly. Uh, question for Lieutenant General Ng on the HADR Centre. Um, how much uh, is being done in um, coordinating with civilian organization in this part of the world? Um, will they have, a, you know, like hum uh, sorry, the International Red Cross and so forth? Because I think we've seen from HADR operation that um, sometimes the military and the civilian aid organization have uh, problems coordinating with each other. I, from personal experience, it's a very good question. Okay, um, shall we go around? Let's let's start with you, General. We've got sorry, someone. Else. Oh, all right. Well, you a late comer, but you, I'll let you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's more a comment. Um, looking again at the, the title of this session, um, a comment concerning the impact of new military capabilities, not just on regional security dynamics, as, we, as we've heard much discussed, but on the regional armed forces themselves the armed forces of individual states in the region. I mean, are investments, let's say, in bespoke modern capabilities the best investment for many armed forces in this region? Many states beyond the regional big spenders are buying assets beyond big, you know, the procurements you tend to hear about the big ticket items like carriers, but some of the more interesting procurements are in the subsurface realm, anti-ship missiles, things like that. And these come at a time when I think armed forces remain, many of them in the region, remain preoccupied by domestic security requirements, force modernisation imperatives such as investments in personnel and training, boosting the force from the bottom up. So is there a danger that these procurements could risk, risk warping national defence priorities to some degree for some of the smaller states? And indeed, are some of the capabilities we've heard discussed today best used or held by military forces. Now, I suppose use of military command control networks is a, is a, a clever use of something that the armed forces specialize in, uh, and military transport assets will always be of utility. But for, for, for instance, in HADR, should more be done to develop the capacities of the civil sector, the responsiveness and resilience of the civil sector in some of the countries deemed at most risk of these capacities, so that armed forces in the region can, in some cases, concentrate on their core tasks. More just a comment. Sorry, we didn't get who you are represent. I'm James Hackett. I'm the editor of the Military Balance at the IAAS. Oh, okay. Thanks, James. It's um, only really so. Um, quick, quick left. With that, I'll start with you, General. We'll go left to right. And if you want to quickly uh, wrap up with any concluding thoughts, do so as well, please. Sure. Thank you. Thank you for the question uh, or comment. Uh, it is recognised that the military and the civilian sectors would need to work together. So whether it is a disaster in our region or greater region, I think AHA and the RCC will have to hold hands so that the military components and the civilian components can work hand in glove. Um, there are unique relative strengths in each of the sectors that the military bring in and the NGOs will bring in. So I agree with you, we have to work hand in hand. Okay. And uh, to Mr. Banuri, I, I, got, I hope I got your pronunciation correct. Um, whether technologies or doctrine 
drives overall military capabilities, I think it's an iterative process. And at some culmination point, you have a revolution in military affairs. From the Mongols that conquered much of Asia and ventured into Europe in ancient past, the combination of a rider and a horseback and the technology of arrows, the combination of putting these two together was an RMA at the earliest time. In our periods, technological advances in precision strike capabilities, laser LGBs, was born out of the Americans' ineffectiveness in bombing, in their bombing campaign in Vietnam. A hundred sorty mission to remove a bridge was done with a flight of four F-111s with LGBs. Conversions, of course, certain miniaturization of technologies, and of course the precision capabilities that meld into one weapon system called the LGB. So it's always an iterative process, and uh, over time, we are, sometimes we don't know which drove what, but in, with hindsight, usually we can say something did happen. That's the best I can give you. Thanks. Well, it's a very good example. It's a sort of horse and tank moment. It's, it arrives every 10 years. Now it's every two minutes. Uh, just a quick one. What do you think about that suggestion that uh, countries should invest in civil command and control capacity rather than use the military? Well, I'm, I, I am a pragmatic person. If it, if it can be done, it would have been done. So I'm, I'm more pragmatic, really. If the the civil side could have done it, I'm sure the preparations would have been done. Because the scale of disaster in Aceh, in Myanmar, in Haiyan, were huge. We're talking about four, 500,000 people. So if the preparations of economics, the finances of it, and the real effort are possible, I'm sure they would have done it. So. I would love to hear your views again, please. Yeah, just in response, if you look at the impact of the, the, I think, a typhoon that hit eastern India, Orissa, last year, the deaths were in, I think, under a couple of hundred because the population was prepared and they developed civil defence in that area such that the people went into shelters. And compared to the Philippines, I think the contrast was quite staggering. Yes, that's why, that's why I say I agree with you. So if the localities are prone to national disasters, the local government will have prepped themselves. And the need for extra regional or uh, external party to come in, the needs will be minimized. So that's, that's why I mean I agree with you, but for those areas where people are less prepared, then these mechanisms are going to be useful. Good. Dr. Braxiba. Well, thank you very much, first of all, for this uh, interesting Discussion. I would just like to stress at the end the point of view that was made by a colleague from Singapore that indeed military and civilian components can work together and if they work together successfully this is certainly an important step to come to a system of confidence building. This is also an experience that we've made in Germany and in, in Europe in recent years and so uh, just to, to wrap up, I just want to stress again this uh, combination of these both components. Thank you. General Yao. Uh, I think I support greater transparency and clarity in military budget and uh, military capabilities. But the most important thing is military or strategic intention. Um, so, I also support the ASEAN way of doing things, that is to uh, give consideration to the, that, so that everyone would think, would feel comfort, comfort on how, 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 how trans transparent you are going to be. Uh, but Generally, I think China has been more and more transparent, and China will be more and more transparent in its military budget and in its military capabilities. And, uh, but if your question is challenging the credibility of the data that has been released by the government, 
I will not answer your question. Uh, on the question of uh, which drives which technology or uh, and uh, uh, military and doctrine, I think it interactives the, the military technology and uh, doc, uh, operational doctrine, they interact act to drive both of them forward. So I basically agree with my, uh, with General Huang, he, he, his surname is not N, it's Huang in Chinese. Just get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> I basically agree He's with his polite. idea. <laughs> um, and on the uh, anti-satellite um, test, I, I would like to refrain myself from, a, from calling that test an anti-satellite. And uh, the, the United States has had many such tests during the Cold War, so it, it has more mature technology to bring the extinct satellites back to Earth uh, and causing less debris. So my suggestion is that why the United States not, explore, not cooperate with China on all the space firing nations on how to, to bring back that satellites back to Earth in the more secure, more clean way, which caused no debris or fewer debris in space. That's all my question. I think that's it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Thank do. you, my lord. That's very good. Thank you very much indeed, General Mark. Um, Probably the first one, and it was an interesting point that was brought up uh, on the HADR. And we often talk about capacity building and uh, working with other nations to build to build their their HADR capabilities. But we tend to focus on those capabilities after the fact. And I think you brought up a good point. We should actually build and and focus capacity building on the ability to prepare, not just respond. And uh, so I think that's the pre the preparation area is a bit that we're we're probably lagging. There, so I think that was a, a good point there. Um, with regards to, I think the question was merging, merging new capabilities. Are they uh, leading to new uh, security doctrines? The answer is yes. Um, as you see, the countries in the region developing their new strategies and force structures uh, in support of their growing national interests. Um, you're seeing new technologies and capabilities coming into this that allow the, the new doctrines to be developed to maximise the chance of achieving their, their, their strategies. Uh, you're seeing the greater reach of weapons, greater precision, uh, what we've talked about a couple of times here today, the emergence of cyber, uh, the importance there and whether we actually fully understand the impact of that yet. Um, and therefore, no, as the technologies evolve, these new technologies lead to new capabilities, allow greater aspirations for countries in the, the region uh, as they're developing their strategies. And, I guess if I was just to say one thing, it's because of that uh, evolution that uh, now more than before, ever before, we need to develop that multilateral regional framework to ensure greater transparency and less chance of misunderstanding, less chance of miscalculation into the future. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much. I mean, just uh, the right of the chair, if you'd like to make two or three points. I mean, on your point about um, preparation, I absolutely endorse what Mark just said. But the military's core skill is to analyze, plan, and execute that plan very quickly and efficiently. Uh, in my experience, there's no civilian organization that will be able to match it, uh, an efficient militaries. So why not exploit them? Um, I don't think it is um, a bad use of the military, um, unless they're in the middle of a war, in which case I don't think the humanitarian disaster, sadly, is going to matter too much. So it's actually rather a good use of the military, in my humble opinion. Um, one thing that's come out to me, I don't know about all of you, is that there's a, a, a gulf of understanding here in the region. You know, I've heard 
General Yao and I've heard others and it came out this morning and I uh, uncharacteristically perhaps I absolutely endorse your point about transparency and building on um, our understanding of each other in the region because a lot of it is built or the suspicions are built on a misunderstanding and we worked very hard in Europe to get around that in the Cold War era uh, and maybe uh, it's a sensible thing to focus a little bit more on now because you don't understand each other and there doesn't to be too much effort sometimes to understand the other person's perspective, which wouldn't be a bad idea. And then on a more military note, um, I would say, as I've now retired officer, Lord Richards, uh, focus on what will win future wars and deter future wars rather than what will win past wars. There's quite a lot of focus on old military technology that's being brushed up. Uh, that, won't, that won't be what will win future wars. And it's those technologies that will also deter future wars if you are being transparent in your messaging. Uh, can I ask all of you to show your appreciation for four excellent panelists uh, particularly General Yao, I guess so. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're really, very, very good.